Lord, prepare me. Here to worship today, let us say amen. If we are truly here to worship today, let us say hallelujah. Hallelujah is supposed to be the highest form of verbal praise that there can be. I do not know what's going on, but I feel good today. I feel good. I'm excited. I'm excited because I feel like I have been released. And I'm going to explain to you what that means. I, I've been here now. It's, been, it's going on a little over four months. And, and I've seen a lot of chains broken. I've seen a lot of growth just in that short period of time. I've seen people stepping up to do things and I have not taken any time at all to enjoy it. And the reason that I haven't taken any time to enjoy it is because one thing about serving in the military, it teaches you to always be vigilant. And part of always being vigilant is when I see all of these things going on, when I see people coming up to the altar, when I see people saying, what can I do for Christ? When, when I see all of that, what used to happen in my mind was I would say, okay, God is working, good things are happening, where is the attack going to come from? So my, my thing was I'm, I'm, I'm being ever vigilant, watching out for where the enemy is going to attack from. But I feel that I've been released from that, and I'll tell you that part of the reason for that is because of the prayer team that we started, and the humbling experience of knowing that people are praying for you. And, and the humbling experience of knowing that it is not, that I don't always have to be on watch for the enemy if I have the shield of faith that God is given to, because it's God's shield. And so I, I'm feeling good today because I feel like, I, I feel that release, I feel that humbling experience of people praying for me and I just see the wonderful things that God is doing here. I'll, I'll, another thing I'll tell you is I feel in this, these few months I've learned more about agriculture and farming than I ever knew in the first 40 years of my life. I've had those conversations. I, I talked with Tim Kyle about farming. I've talked with Farrell about farming and, and went out on what seemed like at that time the coldest day of the year to uh, see what he does for a job and told him I'll go out again but when it's warm. I, I've talked with Lauren about agriculture and how seeds are sold and, and, and so I've learned a lot and the reason I, I bring that up is because one of the one of the surprising things to me is you don't know what you don't know till somebody tells you you don't know and one of the things I learned is how wheat is grown and, and they I remember them telling me yeah they're planting wheat I'm like what do you mean they're planting wheat it's about to get cold and they say oh yeah we plant it and then it's dormant over the winter and then it comes up in the spring I said oh I didn't know that. And so last week, it's oddly enough, the discussion last week was about how we needed moisture. And, and because in order for that wheat to be healthy, uh, we, we needed moisture. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of our farmers were playing, praying for moisture. Well, Tuesday we got the moisture. And yes, it was inconvenient, and yes, it was a big hassle to have to shovel out. And yes, it was a hassle to not be able to go places. But God, thank God for the moisture. Thank God for the things that he does in our life. And it isn't always convenient, but it's what we have to understand is it's about God's will, not our will. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. God's will, not our will. And we're gonna be looking at text um, from two gospel accounts. First, we're going to look at Matthew uh, for those that want to follow along in the Bible, in, in your own Bible, I'll give you the text. We're going to look at the Gospel according to Matthew, 6th chapter, 9th and 10th verse. And we will also look at the Gospel according to Luke, 22nd chapter, 41st through the 43rd verse. So Matthew 6, 9 through 10, and Luke 22, 41 through 43. Now today is our third sermon in our series on prayer. And we are going to see how that circle works today. 
Because when we started out this series, the first thing that we discussed was how as Christians, as followers of a risen Christ, when we pray, there are certain expectations that God has for us if he's going to even hear our prayers. We found that we need to be humble. We found that we need to be seeking after God. We found that we need to be repentant. We found out later that prayer is personal. It is a personal time, a personal discussion between each of us and God, some private time that we spend with God. But we also found out that prayer is communal. We come together and we pray together. And we understand that when we do that, there is power in that prayer. We discovered that prayer isn't about how well we say the words or how much we master whatever language it is that we speak, but it's about what's in the heart. You don't have to be a great orator. You don't have to use big and special phrases or a special type of English in order to speak to God. We can just speak to him from the heart. And we learned that prayer is not about being seen or heard by men. It's about being heard by God. And so now we're going to go even deeper into that prayer and understanding that when we pray, we want to be praying about God's will, not necessarily our will. Now, that doesn't mean we don't pray for the things that we want. That doesn't mean that we don't go to God with request. But we're going to, as we get deeper into it, we're going to understand how true prayer, as we mature in prayer, is about God's will. So I'm going to ask that all who can, as we prepare for the reading of the scripture, would please stand in reverence to the reading of God's word. Starting first with Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And it reads, in this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then Luke 22, 41 through 43 reads, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his most holy and most true word. You may be seated. God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for this word that you have given to us. We thank you for this holy Bible which you have given to us. We thank you for this series on prayer which you are leading us through. And as we prepare to go forth and to hear the word that you have for us this Sunday, I ask that you would just use me in the way that you see fit to deliver your message to your people. And we ask that in the process, if there is someone out there who does not know you or does not have a relationship with you, that they may come crying, what must I do to be saved? If there's someone that has not found a home, that they may come to find a home with us as we grow spiritually through prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when we look at Jesus and... and, and how he taught prayer. The disciples came to Jesus. They said, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? And in the process of doing that, we see in the Gospels that he gave what has come to be known as the model prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Um, most, well, I won't say most, but a lot of people know that prayer. 
And again, I said it has come to be known as the model prayer. But we, what we must not do is make the mistake of thinking that when Jesus said, in this manner, pray, he was saying that the model way to pray is to use these exact words. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're using the Lord's Prayer as your prayer when maybe you don't have anything to say, or if you're using it as a part of a prayer that you're saying, you, it's great. But when we say that this is the model prayer, we aren't saying that these exact words are the model prayer. What we're saying is that Jesus gave us a, he gave us a blueprint. He gave us an order. He gave us a structure to what should be involved when we pray. And the very first thing that he begins with is that when we pray, our focus should be on God. It should start out focusing on God. And when we look at our text today, that's exactly how Jesus starts out. If we're going to start out focusing on God, two things happen. Recognition of who we're praying to and praise. And how does Jesus do that? He says, our Father who art in heaven. There's your recognition. There's no doubt who we're speaking to. We're speaking to our heavenly Father. We're speaking to our Creator. There, that is the recognition. And then the praise comes in, hallowed be your name, holy. Holy is your name, God. So if we're going to have that model prayer, it all starts out with the recognition and the praise to the one whom we're praying. Now, Jesus chose these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. But there are all sorts of ways that one can choose to recognize and praise God as they go into prayer. For some of you, when you're in that personal time, that private time with God, you might want to approach God and recognize him and praise him with a song. So a song that has been placed on your heart that talks about who God is, talks about how you feel about God, and offers praises. That might be your way of starting. That might be your way of recognition and praise. For some people, it's going to be talking about who God is. They might start out Father in heaven, creator of the heavens and the earth. You are merciful, you are gracious, you are kind, you are loving. You are the judge of all of the universe. But in that, again, there's recognition of who God is and there's praise for God. Who God is. Some might start, you might start out just going to God, thanking him for what he has done for you. Oh, Father, thank you for my salvation. Thank you for seeing me through the difficult and hard times. Thank you for seeing me through the storms in life. You are my counselor. You are my, counsel, my, my comforter. You are my all in all. But even if you do it that whatever way you choose to do it, if you are approaching God with that recognition of who God is and that praise, you got the blueprint. You may not use the exact words, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, but in essence you are doing the same thing. Now what's important though is what follows? Because after we have the recognition and after we have the praise, the next thing that comes in prayer is submission to God's will. We pray and we submit to God's will. When we look at the text here, what does Jesus say in verse 10 of Matthews? He says, your kingdom come. God, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And let's make that a little bit more personal. God, your kingdom come. Your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. What, what we're doing is we're submitting completely and totally to the will of God. Again, we're not saying that you can't make requests. God wants to hear your request. All throughout the Bible, he tells us, I want to hear your request. But what we ha as we mature and as we grow in prayer and as we grow as Christians, what we will start to understand is that those requests need to be made in submission to God's will. And Jesus gives us the perfect example. He helps us to understand that sometimes our will may not be in line with God's will. And he does that in chapter 
22, verse 42 of Luke. What does he say? Father, if it is your will, and notice where we're starting there. He hasn't asked for anything yet. He is going to make a request of God, but before he even makes that request, he say, he's saying, Father, I'm going to make a request of you, and if this request is within your will, I want you to grant this request. That is submission to God in prayer. Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. In other words, Father, if it's in your will, could I please not have to go through what I'm going to have to go through in the next several hours? Father, if it's in your will, could I not get arrested? Could I not get beaten? Could I not get hung on a cross? If that is in your will, will you do that for me? He's submitting his request to God. And what's interesting is when we look at this text, it, is almost, it almost seems as if it is immediate that Jesus realizes and it probably is immediate because Jesus knew why he came. He realizes his request is not within the will of God. So what does he say? Nevertheless, not my will, not my will, God, but your will be done in my life. Not what I want, God, but what you want for me. That is submission in prayer. And Jesus gives us the perfect example. Now understand that this is not an easy task, and this is not something that we're human beings. And all of us, to some degree, have some degree of selfishness. And, and, and we have things that we want, and we have things that we think we need. So we're asking for those things, but what we have to learn to do, we have to learn to do it within the will of God. And that's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. And how do I know it's going to be hard for us? Because my thought pattern is if it was hard for Jesus, and Jesus was fully God, fully man, if it was hard for him, it's definitely going to be hard for me. Jesus shows us that it was difficult in Verse 44, what does he say? He, it says that being in agony, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. What must that have looked like? What must our Savior have been going through to continue to earnestly pray? Pray so hard that he's in the garden of Gethsemane. He's on his knees. He's, he's praying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And he is praying so hard that the sweat on his forehead is falling like drops of blood. That, it, the word they use is agony pain. He was praying so hard. And we will have those times in our lives when, it, when we're praying so hard because there's something that we want so bad or something that we feel that we need so bad that it's like agony. It, there are going to be times when it's difficult. but we can be prepared for those times because when we pray within God's will, God strengthens us through that. Again, the text shows us that. Jesus is in agony. He's praying. He's, he's praying earnestly. He, he wants, if it's at all possible, for this thing that is going to happen to him not to happen. But he also wants to do the will of God. And in doing the will of God, he realizes what he's asking for is not going to happen. But what does the text tell us happens? It says in verse 43 of Luke, Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. 
Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. So even in this agony and, 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 and a point where maybe he doesn't feel that he can go on, maybe he feels that his strength is going to fail him. An angel comes and strengthens him. And our Lord and Savior, our God, does the exact same thing for us when we are praying and submitting to his will and his will and our will don't add up and we're going through that situation, he strengthens us. What type of angels does he send in our life? What were you going through? What has happened? Maybe that angel was someone that just said a kind word to you in the market. Maybe that angel was the phone call that came at just the right moment when you thought that there was no other thing that you were in so much despair. Maybe that angel was that family member or that loved one or that church member who came into your life. Maybe that angel was the stranger that you never saw again. But the thing is that when we are praying and we are within the will of God, whatever we have to go through, God doesn't abandon us. He will strengthen us. There was a woman who lived in New Orleans. Her name was Hattie. Hattie May, but she hated if you called her Hattie May. It was Hattie. Most people called her Miss Hattie. She was a fixture in New Orleans. She had lived there all of her life. She was born there. She attended schools in New Orleans. When she went off to college, she went to Dillard University in New Orleans. She met her husband and married. She taught school for 32 years in the New Orleans school district. When her husband died, he was buried in New Orleans. And now Miss Hattie was sitting in her house. She was in her early 70s, having lived her entire life in the city of New Orleans. And then Hurricane Katrina had came. When the hurricane hit, she was evacuated to the Superdome in New Orleans. And later, she was evacuated to Houston. And she was sitting in a shelter in Houston when she prayed, Lord, all that I've ever known in my life is New Orleans. Please, Lord, let me be able to return to New Orleans and live. And almost every night it was the same. Lord, New Orleans is all I've ever known. Please, Lord, let me return to New Orleans and live. Well, a few months went by and some relatives that lived in Philadelphia found her and they moved her to Philadelphia. She knew nothing of Philadelphia. Again, 70 plus years of life now, all lived in the same place. And again, she's praying that same prayer. Lord, I've never known anything else. Please, if it be possible, can you let me move back to New Orleans? Well, as time went on, Miss Hattie started to realize that Looking at the situation in New Orleans, there was a good chance that she might never, ever be able to move back to New Orleans, but she still wanted it. So her prayer changed. She said, Lord, if it's possible, I would really like to be able to move back to New Orleans. But if it's not possible, just give me the strength to do whatever your will is. I noticed the prayer changed there. The prayer, she isn't saying, I don't want to go back to New Orleans. She still wants to go back to New Orleans, but she's now becoming more submissive in her prayer. She's saying, if it's possible, God, if it's your will, God, but if it's not your will, then just give me the strength to do whatever your will is. That's submission in prayer. And as this went on, certain other things happened. Miss Hattie, she found a church, and, and that church didn't have a musician. It needed a musician. Now, I told you Miss Hattie taught for 33 years in New Orleans. What she taught was music. She was a music teacher. Her master's degree was in music. She could play the piano, she could play the organ, and she also knew how to teach vocal music. So she said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll volunteer my time and I'll play until God sends me someplace else. 
Well, in the process of playing in the church, some people came to her and uh, there were some kids that were getting in trouble in the neighborhood, younger kids, uh, because they really, there wasn't anything for them to do. There wasn't a park, there wasn't a rec center, and some of these kids wanted to learn how to play the piano. So Miss Hattie said, I'll tell you what, I'll volunteer my time, I'll teach them the piano, it'll get, it'll get them something to do, and so they won't be out on the streets. Now she's still praying, God, if it's possible, I want to go back to New Orleans. But give me the strength to do what you want me to do. So then some adults came to her and said, well, you know, we want to learn how to play the piano too. She said, well, um, I'm not volunteering my time for that. If you want to pay, I'll teach you how to play the piano. So these adults came and now she has piano classes. And then she started to help out. This church had multiple choirs. It had more than one. And she, so she started to help out with the choirs. And all of a sudden, even though there was still that part of her that wanted to go back to New Orleans, she felt as if she was being lifted up. She felt as if she was being strengthened. She felt as if she had a purpose. You see, when we submit to God in prayer and start to do his will, not only does he strengthen us and lift us up, he helps us to be a blessing to others. Again, Jesus gives us the perfect example. As he is in that garden praying, not my will, but your will be done. As he's in that garden saying, Lord, if it's possible, please let this cup pass from me. As he's in the garden doing that, he is submitting to the will of God, knowing what must happen. And everyone sitting in this sanctuary today, everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior should be thankful that Jesus submitted to the will of God because if he had not done it, there would be no opportunity for salvation for us. Jesus submitting to the will of God was a blessing. And so it was the same with Miss Hattie. Miss Hattie said, you know what, I want to go back to New Orleans. Can you please let me go back to New Orleans? But finally, she submitted in her prayer to the will of God. And what happened? A church got a musician. Kids got a piano teacher. Adults got a piano teacher. There were people to help out with the choir. There, Miss Hattie, through her submission to God in prayer and saying, not my will, but your will be done, God. She was a blessing to the community that she was in. So, about a year and a half go by and finally Miss Hattie does get a chance to go back to New Orleans to see her home. Well, where her home used to be because it wasn't there anymore. So she visited and then she went to the cemetery. She visited her, the gravesite of her husband. She spent a few days there and then she got on a plane and went back to Philadelphia. When she arrived at Philadelphia, a cousin was waiting to pick her up and the cousin was all excited and, and hugged her and kissed her and said, oh, Miss Hattie, it's so good to have you back. Miss Hattie looked at her cousin and she said, it's good to be home. See, even if our will doesn't line up with God's will. We will always get more benefits from doing God's will. And in the beginning, it doesn't seem like that. But if we pray earnestly and say, God, not, not my will, but your will be done, one of the first things that happens is we are strengthened and with that strength comes a sense of peace. That's what Miss Hattie had there. She had a sense of peace. You know what? Guess what? It's not God's will that I go back to New Orleans. I'm going to do what God wants me to do in Philadelphia. And she had that sense of peace. The second thing that it does is it helps us to learn to trust God. 
Because when we are going in a direction totally different from where we want to go and we're looking at the situation and we can see there are going to be roadblocks, there are going to be walls thrown up, there's going to be potholes that we can fall into, there's going to be people shooting at us, there's going to be all sorts of different things happening that we know already this is not going to be an easy or a good situation that God is sending me into. We have to trust that God is not going to send us into that situation unprepared. So when we submit to God's will, we get that sense of peace, but it also helps us to learn to trust God. And when we trust God, what we learn is it does not matter who the person is. Moms, dad, brothers, husbands, wives, sisters. It doesn't matter. The only one who will never fail you or never let you down or never disappoint you is God. And when we learn to submit to him in prayer, we gain that trust. And the final thing that happens when we submit to God in prayer is the thing that we've been talking about for weeks now. We grow spiritually. Before Miss Hattie had her incident with Hurricane Katrina, she was a Christian woman. She was a praying woman. But she became a different type of woman. She came, became a stronger woman in prayer after she went through everything with Hurricane Katrina. She became stronger after she went through everything of not being able to go back home. She became stronger once she got that sense of peace and said, you know what, right here is where God wants me to be. Right here is where I'm going to be. So what we have to learn about prayer is ask God, take your petition, whatever that is, whatever your request is, Take it to God. But understand that the answer may not always be yes. And because of that, we have to submit our wills to God's will. The prayer needs to be, God, I want to be healed of this illness. If it is your will. If it's not your will, give me the strength to do your will. Lord, I, I want this new promotion. If it is your will, if it is not your will, give me the strength to do what your will is. Lord, I, I really would love to live in sunny California where it never snows and it's 70 all day. But if it is your will that I live in Fargo, North Dakota, then give me the strength to live in Fargo, North Dakota. Whatever your will is, God, let that be mine. And so as individuals, each of us as individuals, if we are to grow spiritually, if we are to increase that trust in God, if we are to have peace, we must learn to try and line our will up with God's will. And when it doesn't line up, to be submissive in our prayer and say, not my will, but your will, God. As a community, as a body of believers at First Baptist Church, we have to learn that there may be a direction that we as a body think the church should go in, but we also have to remember that it's not our church, it's God's church. And if God says turn left and we want to turn right, we need to be within the will of God and turn left. It may not seem like that's the easiest path to go, but God never promised he would send us the easiest way. Amen. And we also have to learn you don't grow through easy. Anybody who's ever done bodybuilding knows that it hurts. It's not fun. I don't care what anybody tells you, what any bodybuilder tells you, weightlifting is not fun. The results afterwards are what are fun when you look in the mirror. But the work itself is not fun. So we have to accept that God may send us in a direction where the road is rocky, but we need to be doing his will. And what is his will? Well, for us, I can tell you, his will has been very apparent over the last few months. God expects for us to be a praying community, to pray for each other and with each other. God expects for us to be a community that is unified. Even though we may not agree on the methods, we, we agree on the destination. So God expects 
it is God's will that we be a group that is unified. God, it is God's will that you search yourself and discover what those gifts are, and it is God's will that you use them. And not just here, not just at First Baptist, but in the community out there. That's God's will. Say, well, you know, Pastor, I hear what you're saying, but how do you know that? Understand, these aren't my words. All you have to do, there's this book. It's got 66 books in it. And if you open it up and you, and you read it, God's will is all through it. And God speaks a lot about unity within the body. God speaks a lot about prayer. God speaks a lot about us using our gifts. So this isn't something that I'm coming up with. This is God's word. And if I'm going to do my job, if I'm going to do what God's will for me is, I have to be honest about it. 